ladies and gentlemen, uh, sisters and brothers. Now, today's program is uh, very close to my heart, being a second generation immigrant child myself. My father came here. Therefore, the identity of being what is a British Muslim or what is a, a British Asian, you know, the whole sort of matrix has always sort of touched me and I have thought of it continuously. So it's really good that today Brother Saeed and um, uh, Sister Fatima have decided to hold this particular um, program um, with open discussions and Gulf Cultural Club. Incidentally, my name is Shabir Rosli. I'll be hosting the program this evening and will introduce the, our guest speakers um, as they come along. So far, our guest speakers are on their way, so I'll request one of the speakers to talk after introducing her. So the whole idea of Muslim identity, whether living in the UK or in Europe, um, you know, whatever the numbers are, uh, around 3 million Muslims live in the UK, 20 to 25 million in Europe, and they all come from different backgrounds. In the UK, it's uh, sort of mostly South Asian, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi background, which constitute a great majority of a great number of the Muslims living here. Then obviously you've got the Iranian, the Arabs, and within the Arabs, you've got obviously many different backgrounds. So some might say it's a fragmented community, some might say it's a mosaic of communities, depending how one looks at it. Obviously, the challenges as the community grows um, from second to third generation, and it is quite often said uh, by uh, capitalists and sort of the Western thinkers that give us three generations and we change you all together. So, you know, whether that in itself is a thought to think about is, and also in business, we say that the first generation makes it, the second generation is, enjoys it, and the third generation destroys it. So, you know, if you look at business organizations, by the time they're in the third generation phase, that business organization doesn't exist. So does that happen to the community also, to the culture in itself, that by the time a third generation arrives, have they totally assimilated, or have they really uh, become part of the community and integrated? Again, these two words are loaded, and, you know, one may talk about integration, or assimilation, both are very sort of um, words which have different meanings to different people. So I think the discussion today would be quite poignant, um, especially as this new film or new clip which was released a couple of months ago where Muslims were sort of uh, singing and dancing and enjoying themselves to music. There's been a lot of um, sort of uh, media hype on it. Um, I understand about 1.5 million people have visited or seen that clip and uh, the Independent and other newspapers have also covered it. There are also interesting sort of uh, references if you look at that, the clip, the people who viewed it have talked about it again in the same manner that I talked about earlier. Some people have said that it's a totally uh, anti-Islamic video, others have said that no, it actually portrays Muslims in a better light. So, you know, you have a whole discussion there in itself. So, let me not take too much of the time of our speakers and introduce our first uh, presentation by Yasmin Jamaluddin. <coughs> she is, she graduated from LSE in 2013. That makes me feel really old, right? <laughs> uh, uh, with, with a degree in government and economics, she has previously worked at Chatham House, the LSE Middle East Centre, and London Citizens, among others, and has been a persistent activist. Um, having been president of LSE, LSE Palestine Society and is currently the secretary of the Iraq Youth Foundation, she is interested in the role and interplay between culture, nationality, and religion and is a keen writer blogging at Escape the Cage, as well as contributing to Islamicat, a current affairs website that examines political and religious cultures. In the coming year, she will be undertaking postgraduate studies in religion and religion in the contemporary world. So please welcome Yasmin in a warm welcome. absolutely honoured to be able to join you all and share some of my thoughts um, as a panellist, um, who are hoping the rest of the panellists will join us in a bit. Um, but in order to get this discussion going, um, 
I think it's first important to approach any sort of discussion where we're talking about identity and things that are very personal with a really open mind and with a mind that encourages and tolerates the views of other people because I think they were all entitled to define ourselves the way we choose and, <clears throat> and as such I think it's just a crucial uh, step in the right direction that this video came along and opened this discussion about what it means to be a Muslim and how um, being Muslims that are based in the West, uh, what kind of repercussions that kind of video and the wider context has on our identity. So my approach to preparing for this discussion was a bit puzzling because um, I've been born and bred in London, and um, but I've always obviously been a Muslim and I've never really doubted that I've questioned things, I've researched, but I've never doubted the fact that I believe in the doctrine of Islam and that's always been the center, the center to my identity. Um, but I came to the realization that there were a lot of questions that I couldn't really answer and didn't really understand. And I think this video really brought them into the limelight. Um, so that, you know, these are some of the things I'm going to sort of talk about during my uh, presentation. Um, but in terms of the focus of this event, I think it's important to uh, you know discuss what we're actually what the topic of this discussion is, which is we're asking questions about what does the Muslim identity mean for Muslims in Europe. Um, and how do we draw the line between assimilation and faithful practice? And so these are sort of the questions that are really integral to this discussion and ones that I'm going to try and touch on um, as, we go, as we go through this event. So my immediate reaction was, why are we eager to define ourselves and set ourselves apart as Muslims in Europe? Uh, why are we searching for an identity? Is, is this question even answerable? You know, like, what is the identity of a Muslim in Europe? Um, and if we were gathered here today talking about the Arab identity or the Indian identity or the English identity, uh, it would have been understandable because the parameters of these identities are rooted in language, they're rooted in cuisine, in custom, in attire. But with Muslims, we don't speak one language. We are not ethnically homogenous. We don't wear the same clothes. And in fact, we are a very diverse body of people from all walks of life and from all around the world. And indeed in chapter 49 of verse 13, God himself tells us, O oh men, behold, we have created you all out of male and female and have made you into nations and tribes so that you might come to know one another. And this, is a, this diversity is indeed a gift. It's something that we have to cherish and to really take care of as Muslims. Um, and it's, it's through these means that we can unite and not divide. And we are to use, if we are to use our difference of location, our ethnic background to further that knowledge, that can only be of a huge benefit to us. Um, and so in terms of the, the definition of British Muslim, we're trying to answer this question. I think maybe it's first important to understand if that's even a necessity or whether it's possible. Um, so I thought the first thing I'd sort of talk about is what it actually means to be a Muslim, because if we bring the dialogue back to what it is to be a Muslim, that way we can decide if tagging things along like British Muslim, Muslims of Europe, European Muslim, etc., whether they are actually definable. So to be a Muslim, from my understanding, um, is to observe that there is one God um, and to whom we submit ourselves to, our ambitions and our will. This is the point of departure, Tawheed, the recognition of the oneness of the Almighty which translates into the uncompromising implication that it is God alone to whom we submit our dependence and needs towards. Um, so to be a Muslim is to act mercifully, it's to behave kindly and lovingly towards people. To be a Muslim is to be a positive role model, uh, indeed an example for our communities and to inspire, to educate and to spread a message of justice and peace. So, the Holy Prophet himself even stated that the best of you are the most good-natured. And this is what I'm trying to bring, you know, the point that I'm trying to focus in on is that to be a Muslim is essentially to be a good person, to be a good person with people, to be a good person with nature, with the environment, and with the community at large. And indeed, as we travel along the path towards the Almighty, our humanity should heighten, our love should deepen, and our wisdom should tighten. And Arthur Bula explained in, in a quote, I'm about to read to you. The closer one gets to God, the closer and more compassionate one feels towards one's being, fellow beings. So if we can agree that on a fundamental level, that these are the defining features of a Muslim, then can we truly be defined by mere geography when it comes to the embodiment of these traits? Can a Muslim who happens to reside in the United Kingdom, like myself, be distinguished uh, from a Muslim in New Zealand? And my argument would be that no, you can't distinguish between the Muslim of New Zealand and the Muslim of Great Britain, 
because we, if, if these are the principles that define us as Muslims, then surely we already can sort of define them without having to tag the British or the, you know, the national label alongside that, that name. And based on this analysis, my proposition to you all tonight is that we should abandon altogether the abstract preoccupations about so-called Muslim identity in the West, or otherwise, and instead live practically and engagingly wherever we may find ourselves dwelling in accordance with the outlined principles and with full remembrance and gratefulness to God. So rather than theorizing about what our identity is and what it means to us today, I think we should build, instead build an acknowledgement that in fact one's true and meaningful identity does not rest upon the labels that one attaches to oneself, that relate to ethnicity, to nationality, and even to religion, but rather that the actions that we take and the words that we utter are the defining factors of who we are. So we're defined by our deeds, we're not defined by the language we speak, we're not defined by the passport we bear, it's the content inside of us and the content that we give to the world that identifies us. And indeed, we're reminded again in our holy book that um, in, chapter, in chapter 18, verse 46, that wealth and children are an adornment of this world's life, but good deeds, the fruit whereof endures forever, endures forever are of far greater merit in thy sustain as light, and a far better source of hope. So our deeds, the ones that we present to the world, and the ones that God will account for when we eventually uh, are returned to him, that's a legacy um, that we leave in this world, and that's what defines us and defines our destiny in the hereafter. So if we want to generate a more positive and indeed a more accurate perception uh, of Islam in the West, we need only to align our conduct with the principles of justice, moderation, peace, and love. And if we do that, then the rest would surely follow. Um, my next point is I just wanted to raise a very small anecdote about my life in terms of uh, my own education. Uh, from the age of five to 10, I went to an Islamic school in London. And although we studied the national curriculum, we also had you know, classes in the Quran and classes in Islamic studies and Arabic language. And although I learned a lot, and I'm, you know, I, that was a very, very crucial part of my education, I remember feeling distinctly dissatisfied with the way Islamic concepts and rules were presented to me as a child. Um, and we were told, you know, this is haram, that is haram, music's haram, hijab, you, have, you must wear, like everything was set in stone, there was no discussion, debate, uh, questioning of the, the rules that were being given to us. So this is a singular case study, it's obviously my experience, and it might not, you know, resonate with a lot of people, but it's an experience nonetheless, and it's something that I wanted to draw from, because um, it contradicts the very essence and spirit of Islam, and indeed any form of spiritual enlightenment, when you are simply fed information and not encouraged and supported in the quest to understand why you do certain things. So in the Quran again, I refer to chapter 30, verse 8, where Allah poses the following question, have they never learned to think for themselves? And I raised this point to really you know, bring the point across that Islam, the way it's presented to our youth and to our children, can, where we only speculate, where we don't even speculate about the rules that we're given, uh, can only be to the detriment of our own identity and what it means to be a Muslim. And uh, Tariq Ramadan, actually, in a recent lecture, said that if people don't get the message, i.e. the Islamic message, uh, it's not because they are kafar, as a lot of Muslims do, do claim nowadays, it's because we don't know how to express the message. And perhaps us not knowing how to express the message is a problem because of the education and the way that Islam is presented to the youth of today. Um, and so, you know, we come to this point about you know, Muslims always being depicted as terrorists, Muslims being, being depicted as, uh, you know, violent people. And we're quick to blame the West, we're really, I mean, I, I was definitely guilty of this, and maybe still am, you know, where we, we blame the West, we blame Europe, we blame America for depicting us in stereotypical ways. But it's, maybe it's time for us to actually look at ourselves and look at the way we do project our identity to the world. Um, perhaps we only have to look at ourselves to truly diagnose the origin and the source of these unfavorable characterizations. Um, it's a victim mentality that really isn't attractive and it's a poor excuse for a deeply rooted problem that we have left to brew for centuries. And by this, I don't mean to say that Islamophobia, for example, is non-existent or that there aren't bigots in the world who mock and vilify Muslims. Um, these people exist and they've existed you know, for centuries, they existed even during the time of the Prophet, and they're gonna continue to exist. Um, 
However, my purpose, again, in outlining this point is to raise a very crucial point about life in this transitory human experience, which is none clearer, again, in chapter 13, verse 11 of the Quran, where God says, and verily, God does not change men's condition unless they change their own selves. Uh, if we're experiencing bigoted racism or ignorant abuse or you know, any of these uh, predicaments um, from those who don't understand or comprehend who we are and what we're motivated by, it is a lot less to do, I believe, with them as it is to do with our inner condition and what we give to the world. And I think that's another point that's come through from this video. So I've now come to the point of maybe discussing a few of the issues I had with the Happy British Muslims video um, that I had originally written about. So people that made this video claimed that it was done in order to show that British Muslims are just happy, this is a quote, uh, are just as happy, eclectic, cosmopolitan, diverse, creative, fun, and outgoing as anyone else. And presumably anyone else entails any normal non-Muslim um, and therefore cutting us all out, the Muslims of the world. So amongst other things, it was a PR campaign, and this is very, made very clearly by the fact that their own objective, when they stated it, was that they were trying to defy stereotypes. So they were clearly trying to you know, present an image of Muslims that would reject the stereotypes that are currently in the media and in all outlets. <coughs> um, so it was appealing to the Western gaze upon Muslims, and as I explained in my blog post, which you can read on my blog, uh, the assimilation of stereotypes is a threat to the Muslim identity as expressed by us in Europe through the subtle internalized projections of Orientalist accounts concerning what Muslims look like and how they are generally perceived. So the crux of my argument was therefore that we should not feel the need to dive into such props such as the video, to articulate what it means to be a Muslim, we don't need to humanize, humanize ourselves according to the dictates of national culture. We are simply human, and we feel anger, we feel sadness, we feel happiness, all kinds of emotions, just as any other person would. And just because some ignorant people think all Muslims are potential suicide bombers, and they're the haram police, and they go around telling everyone what to wear and how to wear it, and you know, music is this and whatever, We're, we are people, and. We don't have to be apologetic for what we believe in as long as we are responsible for what we project to the world about what we believe in. And that responsibility lies with us. Um, we are others, just like Arabs are, just like African Americans are, just as any subgroup of humanity has experienced. But the power to rise above and to transcend this othering that I call is always and will remain with us, but only if we position ourselves as human beings nothing more, nothing less. So not as a British Muslim or as an Iraqi or as whatever, just literally saying, I'm a human and I have these, you know, I have these beliefs and I, this is what I stand for. That's enough. You don't have to appeal to what people think of you in order to explain yourself. And that was the crucial point about the video, in my opinion, is that it inherently subsumes the stereotype of grumpy Muslims or violent Muslims or terrorists. And then it's sought to defy that stereotype through a showcase of music and dance. So I wasn't cynical of the people who made it, and I made that clear in, in my piece, but I did, say, I did say that I was cynical of the agenda that it played into and the kind of narrative that it enforced. Um, many of those who objected to it launched into a tirade of abuse. Uh, there were people saying, you know, people who made this video are going to go to hell, like how dare they dance in public. And then you had the people on the other side who were basically saying how everybody who is critical of this video must be a puritanical Muslim. Um, and to be honest with you, that was the most embarrassing part of this video. It wasn't the video itself, it wasn't uh, anything related to the video in the first stages of it. It was the, the kind of the narratives that were coming out afterwards, all this literally, he said, she said, like really hateful stuff. And it was Muslims to Muslims back and forth. It wasn't even people outside of the, of the spectrum. So the underlying point here is that we really have to understand the fallout that has shone a light on this, this ugly, what I would call an arrogance almost, that resides amongst us. We all think we know it all, and those who don't agree with us are somehow destined to hell. Uh, as many of people, and many people have outrageously declared, like, and you can listen to one BBC radio interview where there were various Muslims being interviewed about the video, and one woman literally told everyone else that they were all going to hell because they believed that what they did was wrong, and you know, it was, literally quite embarrassing to listen to. Um, but the crucial point here is that we are, if we look at, if we take it back to the basics, we are all fallible. We are all searching for the truth. 
and Gatsbus and Daniel Muslims alike, um, and critically but respectfully examining political discourses and activism is a good thing for us Muslims, and we should be doing that. We should be talking about how we are perceived. We should be we should be discussing and understanding our role in society because these are very important issues. But the problem emerges when we ignore the bigger picture and we zone in on this shallow he said, she said debate. And the path is really destined for doom because God himself again in chapter 46, in chapter 8, verse 46, uh, orders, which is that if we are genuinely, genuinely concerned about what it means to be a Muslim in the West or the formulation of the Muslim identity that we prescribe for ourselves, um, we have to know that such questions, or maybe recognize that such questions are ultimately baseless. Uh, and I would say they are basis for the following reason. We are as good or as bad as our actions, and the words and actions I have observed over the last few weeks alone, triggered by this video uh, of Dancing Muslims, has really exposed our weakness. And the work that remains to be done is glaringly steep. I mean, we, rather than produce productive social actors, um, we have become com comfortably complacent and ferociously ready to, react uh, to reactively defend ourselves when aspects of the Islamic faith are targeted like this halal meat uh, debacle that's recently emerged. Um, but this is a huge reality check for us, and if we truly ponder, it's also a great realisation that the power to be who we want to be is firmly in our hands, and that our actions ultimately define how Islam is understood throughout the world. Um, and this is what it means to be a Muslim in the so-called West, and the same should not have been, uh, sorry, and the same should not be, as in what, what we are as Muslims in the West should be the same as if I was to be an Iraqi living in Iraq. The definition, the parameters of how I behave should always be the same because as we all would agree, we believe that Islam is a timeless faith, the Quran is a timeless script and it applies to all ages because that's the beauty of it, that's what brings us all together through it, it's that it is timeless and it brings us all together and the truths that are with, contained within the book will always be true. And if I was to be an Iraqi living in Iraq right now, I would behave and I'd believe the same way as I do now because those are the parameters set by God for us in this world. Um, and ultimately, Islam delivered a message of unity because it was the final manifestation of the message and the dignity of a human being is simply non-negotiable in Islamic terms, uh, regardless of gender, colour and creed. So if Islam has become a source of and a justification for division and disunity, then we have an urgent need to go back to the drawing board of our minds and find out why, because the revolution of the Prophet Muhammad lies precisely in his message of dignity and justice. He didn't compartmentalize people and he didn't encourage people to segregate. And the Islamic faith was delivered as a message of liberation. It wasn't delivered as a message of liberation from the Jews and it wouldn't have been delivered today if it was delivered today as a message of liberation from Americans. It was a message of liberation from the self. And this is a really deep philosophical point that we have to understand as Muslims is to liberate yourself from yourself means you have to seek to detach you from you. And by you, that encompasses your identity, your appearance, your name, indeed everything about you in terms of the categories you've imposed on yourselves, yourself and the ones that society has imposed on ourselves. And until these labels are dismantled, uh, such thinking will continue to exist and we have to start understanding that to define ourselves as Muslim only means to be defined by the sole definer, i.e. God, and not by any other labels that society likes to attach to us or that we like to attach to ourselves. And that's really the heart of Islam and that's really what we should be focusing on as you know, when we talk about identity and what it means to be a Muslim. It really is as simple as that. It's a, a submission to the one and behaving in a good nature with people around you, be they Muslim or non-Muslim, because that's ultimately who we're submitting to and that's what God prescribed for all of us. Um, and so I don't know how much time but I'll really conclude now. Um, my, my, sort of, my conclusion would be that there is no such thing as a so-called Muslim identity of Europe or Muslim identity, you know, American Muslim identity or, or any such uh, equivalent because we are Muslims beginning and end. We shouldn't get worked up about how to define ourselves in Europe and being frantically obsessed with breaking stereotypes and responding to these provocations by the West and by other Muslims who try and dismantle the unity that we, we you know, are trying to build. And only when we achieve this, get, achieve this, will the gift of being able to truly live and breathe as an uncompromising brotherhood 
really materialize. And I don't mean brotherhood with fellow Muslims, as a lot of Muslims will tell you. I mean brotherhood with everyone. And as Malcolm X stated in one of his famous speeches, I, for one, will join in with anyone. I don't care what color you are, as long as you want to be to clean this miserable condition that exists on, on this earth. In another speech, he again stated, I believe in the brotherhood of man, <coughs> all men. He didn't say, I believe in the brotherhood of Muslims. He left the door open for everyone. And again, in the Quran, in verse 36 of chapter 4, God says, and do good unto your parents, and near of kin, and unto orphans, and the needy, and the neighbor from among you, and from among your people, and the neighbor who is a stranger. Nothing could be more beautiful, more liberating than such a universal message of compassion for humanity, for all. And true Islamic faith doesn't discriminate, it emancipates. And therefore, we should remember that when we discuss our identity with the wider community and with the world we need as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin. A lot of territory covered there, and certainly the issue of being defined by deeds and liberation from the self, I think, would resonate with a lot of people. However, there is always a political dimension to everything. Perhaps our other speakers will um, touch on those matters. Our next speaker, uh, both of them have arrived somewhat late, but thank you very much. I know there was a lot of traffic uh, coming here. Um, <coughs> The next speaker is Hannah Smith. Um, she holds an undergraduate um, um, MSc in Geophysics from Imperial College and Master's degree in Geophysics from University of Michigan. And she's also a trained teacher. She teaches at uh, secondary, um, secondary School of Science uh, from the Institute of Education in London. Hannah worked as a physics teacher in London secondary schools for three years and has also worked with Muslim convert community. Authored dozens of articles on Islam, science, culture, and politics for Islam Today magazine, and produced a number of TV shows. She is currently Executive Secretary for Bahrain Salam for Human Rights. Please welcome Hannah in a warm manner. For her <laughs> Muslim community to rethink their Muslim identity in Europe 
and doing so make great efforts to forge faith-centered identities in a multicultural environment and provide authentic Islamic responses to questions such as assimilation and integration. First of all, I think it's useful to look at how identity and identity formation have been defined. So we can like, define identity as a distinct characteristic belonging to any given individual or shared by all members of a particular social category or group and identity is formed, for example, through the adoption or rejection of characteristics, values and beliefs associated with significant others. So, if we move on to conversion. A convert is first recognised as a new Muslim with a Muslim identity after making a rational decision to affirm that they believe in the teaching and principles of Islam and they want to live according to them. Sometimes this decision to become Muslim requires a convert to change pre-existing beliefs and lifestyle habits, while sometimes it's an affirmation of beliefs they have already held, such as the way a prior Christian would agree with the values of love, compassion and mercy for others towards Islam. Converts can only make the decision to become Muslim and adopt a Muslim identity after a period of learning. Before they must gain knowledge in what Islam actually is and what it means to be Muslim, or conversely, what it means to not be Muslim. There are various ways in which a person can discover more about Islam and Muslims. I'm sure you can think of many, e.g. from existing lay Muslims, those that don't consider themselves Islamic scholars, and from scholars, and they can observe their behaviour and ask them directly what Islam means to them. And similarly from books and internet resources, etc. In conducting such research, research, a person will face many challenges. How does one reconcile contrasting beliefs and practices? Is one looking for a single definitive answer or are multiple interpretations connected by a theme permissible? How does one determine whether to become Muslim or not? By which criteria do they measure so-called Islamic and Muslim beliefs? Do they use abstract notions such as truthfulness or virtue? Or their own desires or personal gain, e.g. for a community, a husband, culture, acceptance? Faced with such deep philosophical questions to answer, it often takes converts many years, sometimes decades, to make their testament of faith or shahada, when they actually declare themselves a Muslim. My personal journey to Islam began with a search for absolute truth and reality. As a student of physics, I was curious about the fundamental nature of reality, whether it be physical or non-physical. I was also questioning many aspects of society, this is British society as I was born and bred here, and my lifestyle as a 19 year old student in London. I had come to the conclusion that the material culture in which we live, which encourages us, encourages us to acquire more and more possessions, cannot lead to long-term happiness or peace and contentment. Neither does a hedonistic, hedonistic party-based student lifestyle or an obsession to one's appearance promoted by the fashion and cosmetics industries. Many of my thoughts were linked by the understanding that material aspects of the world can only be sources of short-term transient happiness and cannot be relied upon for long-term contentment. When I, find this, when I found the same narrative in Islam, that peace cannot be obtained through worldly attachments, I felt given my understanding of the world at the time, that Islam was true in this aspect. As I explored other Islamic tenets, such as modesty and chastity, I consistently felt that the Islamic principle was superior in comparison to alternative ideologies and arguments upon reflection of my worldly experience at the time. Ultimately, this led I was convinced that Islam and the Quran were divinely revealed because of the miraculous appearance of modern scientific discoveries in the Quran, and this led me to take the plunge and say shahada. In fact, um, I was convinced by um, a verse in the Quran which refers, which I consider part of my field geophysics. Um, there is a verse which states that mountains have deep roots like pegs, and we've only been able to actually discern this through modern seismology which has come about through the spread of seismometers across the earth in the past 40 years. Once a person has gone through such a process and come to a consensus over what Islam is about and what it means to be Muslim, they then typically go about a process of adapting their behaviour and lifestyle to conform to these new ideas. Since their behaviours and habits have typically arisen from personality, cultural conditioning and environmental factors, they must go through a process of character reformation and cultural lifestyle filter. Sometimes converts end up taking cultural habits associated with other countries or regions, such as Arab or Asian dress and Arabic name. 
Sometimes it's because they genuinely believe it is a necessary part of being Muslim, or sometimes it's out of necessity because they cannot find so-called Western clothes which match their understanding of modest dress. Now, I believe that this process of research and analysis to find personal meaning in Islam, to seek to understand why Islam is the best religion or way of life, is the most important aspect of becoming and being a Muslim. This process that converts go through when establishing their new Muslim identity is a process of understanding which all Muslims must go through in order to understand how to remain faithful to Islam in this new environment, which is the topic of this discussion. A recent research study into conversion um, conducted by Cambridge University and Professor Yasser Suleiman and Christian Becker were here um, sometime last year to actually speak about the study. The study was called Narratives of Female Conversion concluded that conversion may in fact be as much about Islam itself as it is about some interpretations of Western modernity to which conversion often poses many questions. And the importance of this personal search is probably the most single most important teaching method of the Quran, in which humankind is persistently told to reflect upon the physical world, personal experiences, human behaviour and history to understand God's message. There are similarly countless hadith which also point to the importance of reflection, questioning to achieve a clear understanding, and the importance of achieving strong belief. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Verily, the cure for all ignorance is to question. And another saying, although I couldn't find the reference, I read it many years ago, from the Prophet's cousin, Ali ibn Abu Talib, that argues that the sleep of someone with correct belief is better than a night spent in prayer of someone with incorrect belief. Without conviction in the beliefs of Islam, such as the existence of a unified God and the superiority of its moral virtues, the practice of Islam is meaningless and just a mechanical act. Another lesson we can learn from conversion is that converts report their understanding never remain static, fixed in place and time. Again, the Cambridge report states, conversion always is always in a mode of becoming through which a state of being subsists as a core. Conversion is a complex phenomenon. It implies continuity and change, association, and at times involuntary dissociation. It looks back and it looks forward in a journey with meanings which vary with time and from person to person. I believe this is how all Muslims living in Europe should view their faith. The understanding of Islam and the manner in which a person expresses their faith they will change with society and as that person matures as a person and accumulates life experiences. <laughs> the conversion process also demonstrates the process of becoming Muslim and becoming a servant of Allah is not achieved without significant hardship and strife, the true meaning of jihad. Verse 214 of Surah Baqarah states, Do you expect to enter paradise without being tested like those before you? They were tested with hardship and adversity. Converts often face more prejudice than heritage Muslims, and upon conversion lose family, friends, employment, and social class status. A white convert woman, and this is again from the report, is said to lose her white privilege, and a middle class woman may lose her middle class privilege. And the last part of my talk, <coughs> I would like to discuss how the conversion process can be related to the experience of young heritage Muslims in Britain as well as shed light on the challenges for older generations. The young Muslims that I've met as, my part, as part of my work as a teacher and elsewhere already exhibit, exhibit many traits of conversion, and a troubling minority of these young people show signs they have not reached the point of an affirmation of faith, that in essence they are not actually Muslim because they do not believe in God. One piece of evidence for this conversion, like investigation, most young Muslims I've met heavily question the faith, its teachings and practices. Some of the questions I have been asked include, does the Quran promote violent military jihad against non-believers? This is from a, a student who got eight A stars at GCSE. Another, I have always wondered why I can't pray with my shoes on. And the reason these children asked me is because I felt I was an outsider to any ethnic community and that I wouldn't call them a kafir and I wouldn't pass judgment upon them. I have also identified a number of signs of non-belief in young people, including the inability of young Muslims to give reasons for being Muslim, the inability to find even the most basic explanation of what Islam or being Muslim Islam is about, the misinterpretation of the religion as a merely a bunch of rules and regulations, 
and a failure to understand that someone would choose Islam over another religion, another religion and derive positive benefits from this decision. I was once asked, for example, by a class of Muslim children whether I preferred being Christian or Muslim. Hopefully you realise how silly that question is. <coughs> Parents have also informed that in this society, their children are bombarding with a, them with a plethora of questions they have never considered them in their lives and have been unable to answer, having never carried out a deep investigation of Islam for themselves. Such an unquestioning acceptance of the religion by so many born Muslims is in large part due to the authoritarian and didactic style of teaching using the majority of traditional religious lectures, sometimes called majlis, madrasas, and Islamic faith schools, which suppress questioning and push blind acceptance and imitations of the teaching of scholars emanating from traditional institutions. Another reason why a large proportion of the adult heritage <coughs> in this country have never gone through a conversion line investigation of their faith is because as first or perhaps second generation immigrants, they have learnt many of the attitudes and behaviours that are fundamental to Islam, such as good morals and manners, to the norms of their ancestral culture. Examples would include kindness and respect to the infirm or elderly and distributing charity and food to the poor. The younger generation which lives in a society such as this one, where these Islamic values are not the norm, have to go through the conversion process of first identifying and differentiating between different values, attitudes and behaviours including Islamic ones, demonstrating modern, modern British society, and then deciding which ones they would like to adopt. In conclusion, I think that the issue of rethinking Muslim identity would be much easier if all Muslims embarked on a personal quest to discover for themselves in their own understanding what it means to be Muslim in this society. By doing so, it would be much easier to conduct public issue, public discourse around such issues like we are here, more ideas will be generated, and there is infinitely more chance that as a community we will reach the solutions that will please God the most. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, for keeping to the time, and uh, I'm sure you raised a number of points which will be covered in the Q&A. Our final um, speaker um, who made this presentation, uh, and I'm really pleased to introduce my good old friend, perhaps uh, he's younger than me anyway, uh, but he's Sayyid Mosin Abbas, he's the director of Arts uh, Versa and has produced many radio and television documentaries for a variety of channels including the BBC and Channel 4. Over the 10 years he has also projected Muslim counter cultural narratives through a host of workshops, conferences, festivals, exhibitions and concerts often delivered in partnership with institutions such as the University College London, the Barbican and Victorian Albert. Currently he's working as a freelance television broadcaster and driving various contemporary Muslim-inspired socio-cultural and educational initiatives in Britain. Please do welcome Sayyid Mosin Abbas. So we can peace be upon you for Muslim and non-Muslim alike. Um, I'm really here as a, a commentator, I guess uh, a lay anthropologist, you can call me, a lay historian, and somebody who's deeply interested in people, and particularly the Muslim community and its evolution and its development. I mean, Shabir and I go back to the 70s and 80s uh, when we grew up in this country, and quite frankly, we were faced with the issue of uh, racism and the issue of assimilation and integration way back then. So one really disappointing thing is that 60 years after Muslims have arrived in this country, we're having to revisit the same wars, the same battles that we fought many moons ago. So it's disappointing that society at large hasn't moved on and hasn't learned to understand us and understand the people who, who, who've arrived on these shores don't have uh, uh, any great hidden agenda for the destruction of the West or Britain. I think I find that my first biggest disappointment, that we haven't moved on. I think that, first of all, just to clarify, that any community which you look at as a faith-based community which uh, is non-homogenous by nature, simply for the fact that it's probably the only place in the world, uh, London particularly, where everybody from uh, Pakistanis to you know Arabs to Persians through to I don't know 
any type of person from any of the world, any part of the world who is a Muslim, is here. It's almost impossible to create a homogeneity amongst a community which is so disparate and here for, from very different backgrounds, economic migrants, political asylum uh, individuals, people who've come here because they've been asked to come here, uh, because of their, their, their intellectual abilities and their contribution to society at so many levels. So how modern British institutions, the media, cultural uh, big wigs, how everybody can suddenly come up with these uh, grandiose uh, uh, conclusions about this mobile, moving m uh, Muslim homogeneity uh, is beyond me. I mean, I, you know, you can't get two Muslims to usually sit down and agree whether they want a biryani or, or they want uh, a shawarma, uh, let alone try to orchestrate some kind of um, strategy against uh, British culture or British values. Now, okay, let's come on to values because the happy gate, the happy gate affair, the happy video. First of all, when I looked at it, I cringed. So I don't know what my previous speaker said, said on the issue, but I literally cringed because what I felt was it attacked a narrative which I've been firing for for many, many years. That actually, uh, Muslims' uh, prime problem here is perhaps a lack of a cultural narrative. We're not thinking about a vision or a dream of the future. We're kind of making ends meet and getting by and trying to just uh, adapt to society and more latterly actually become apologists for the actions of people who we've got no control over and don't even know who, who sponsors or finances them or, 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 or anything. So we're caught like rabbits in a headlight, set of headlights. Uh, under the full glare of media and the inspection of uh, establishment and ordinances of everybody from I don't know, the English Defence League through to David Cameron, you know, everybody's got an opinion about what Muslims should or shouldn't do. Muslims themselves seem to be the least involved in what that narrative ought to be. Because if I took you to any mosque, any Imam Barba, any Husseinia, any centre in, in, in the country which isn't Saudi Arabian sponsored, or isn't sponsored by the finances of various other agencies and governments, most of them are at each other's throats simply for local ego and, and, and power games within their own particular community. They're not concerned about engineering or socially engineering British society in a way that they want. In, in fact, I would argue that Muslims are the subjects of uh, a, a, a consistent and concerted social engineering exercise. Not just a social engineering exercise, but a political engineering exercise. Not just a political engineering exercise, but a cultural engineering exercise. In fact, everybody seems to be engineering the Muslim community with huge amounts of finance uh, pumped in from Saudi Arabia, because 30, 40 percent of the mosques that do uh, generate people who I consider to be binary Muslims and who encourage binary uh, thinking, if that's what you can call binary uh, thinking. And those binary thinkers exist within the uh, mainstream society as much as they exist within the Muslim community. Muslim package is just a little bit uh, particular and specific. But that social, cultural, political engineering that comes through people who put finances in and then create uh, certain narratives from the pulpit or create certain narratives that have, be, have to be portrayed through certain organizations. And I'll actually come on to those organizations because I think it's quite nefarious and it's quite naughty what's going on even in terms of what the British government uh, and its particular nanny state uh, attitude towards Muslims is. We'll come on to that in a minute. But this being the victim of a social, socio-political, socio-cultural engineering exercise is something you can say, oh, well, here's another one. He's a conspiracy theorist. He's, a, he's got conspiracy. Well, the reality is that, you know, Tony Blair and his nanny state was something which mainstream media and the British public was constantly moaning about during his period. And, and we know what the, the, the outcome of all that kind of nanny stating was. I mean, the education system's in a mess in this country. It's been changed so many times, people have lost track. And I could go through virtually every institution and, and the, the crisis that we're in economically now could probably be laid out. But I digress. The reality is the Muslims are very fundamental to this process of social, cultural, political engineering. They themselves, the leadership, are still most of them living in Pakistan in their heads, living in Iraq, living in uh, uh, 
Iran. None of them are concerned, actually, with the on-the-ground realities of their state here. In truth, they're completely out of touch with the reality of this social, cultural, political engineering of their societies. And, you know, in truth, yes, we have problems back home, but yes, we have issues in our own countries. Yes, those issues are connected to foreign policy, often linked to Britain, often linked to the US. But actually, you know what? The carpet under the, the feet of the community here is being pulled so hard now that it's going to fall flat on its face. Because your next generation is not really actually impacted by what's back, happening back home, as it were, in, in, the, in the minds of many of the first generation, what they're impacted by is this little gadget and the cultural engineering that's coming through here. And when there's no counter-narrative, a clear-cut counter-narrative that either community or parents or the Muslim community is, is able to engage in, when there's no clear-cut uh, vision of what our political engagement in this country is, when there's no cl clear-cut uh, uh, knowledge about where our social direction is in this society, when we have no plan, when we have no dream, when we have no future, you're left for others to socially and politically and culturally engineer you. And that's what's happening. That's what I see as a journalist, as, a, as a, an activist, as a person who's working on the ground. I see a community which largely is not just ambivalent, but is also actually unaware. And I'll give you, I'll start coming on to some examples, because I've thrown a lot of allegations, perhaps, people would argue, and it's probably time to qualify some of these. During my, my time within the uh, viewing of, for instance, the Prevent Agenda, uh, let's come on to Prevent, that's an interesting one. Uh, Prevent Agenda, for those who don't know, was the, the government's major <coughs> reaction to 9-11 and 7-7. So within this Prevent Agenda, the government uh, had dreamt up the idea of recruiting Muslim community to try and start regulating itself. And so this process of assimilation and integration started coming more and more to the fore. And uh, Muslims felt obliged, many of them felt obliged to pander to this. Radical Middle Way was one organisation which was given about a million pounds by government to go and start sorting out the theological or the, the connections uh, within the community to try to get uh, moderate uh, religious leaders to start speaking up because there was clearly a huge over radicalization of the country. Nobody bothered to say, oh, actually, hasn't the British government got a connection with the Saudi Arabian government, which is probably the main purveyor of radicalism and financial uh, funding for those mosques which produce binary thinkers? Nobody to this day in the British government has tackled the fundamental source of funding and resources for those individuals in this country who may not be actually heading towards combining common human values, Islamic values, which are the same as human values, i.e. compassion, generosity, kindness, hospitality. The only sort of people who would may have a, a lack of empathy with those are people on, uh, from what I can see, uh, Saudi-funded agendas in this country. The only other people I can think of who, who are uh, perhaps uh, promoting this uh, agenda openly are the likes of Anjum Chowdhury, who's another organisation. Anjum Chowdhury is another one of our friendly faces that pops up on the television at, uh, at will. The BBC can't find any other Muslim in the entire country to represent our views, but Anjum's always at hand. He's ready to give us that narrative of like probably 0.01% or possibly give the narrative to those Wahhabi or Salafist orientated thinkers. And I won't, I won't accuse all of Salafists or Wahhabis because there are very, very good people and very logical thinkers amongst that community as well. I'm talking more about an agenda which is there, which we're not tackling as a government. And rather than talk about the assimilation and the integration of Muslims and, and Muslims having to do knee-jerk reactions by creating happy videos, I think we need to get a grip, and I think we need to get a grip of the overall uh, 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 strategy that's being rolled out. And hang on, it's not a strategy that started at 9-11. Let me think. There was, a, there was something called the fatwa, and the fatwa of Adel Khomeini actually, for me, is far more close to actually where most of this social engineering, this neocon originated social engineering of Muslims in the West occurs. And let me, let me think again, oh, there's going to be 15 or 20% Muslims across Europe within perhaps 20 to 30 years at the latest. Hang on, politically, what does that mean for the governments in Europe and why would that disturb them? 
Why would they want to get involved in social political engineering? It's fairly obvious to me, because what you need is a set of people who don't talk about usury and economy from the perspective of uh, equality, true equality, who wouldn't look at the idea of banking and its immorality in the current state. You don't want a, a group of people who automatically, in their faith, are instructed that actually these things are fundamentally uh, degrading, and materialism, and the whole postmodernist kind of uh, uh, agenda around anything goes. Well, actually, you know, hang on. Muslims, if they really found their true identity, which they're not, by the way, most of us are struggling to even find what we are, because actually none, none of us can say truly we're Muslim, because it's an aspiration. You can say you've got the kalima, and you can say, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you can profess that, fine, that makes you nominally a Muslim, but a Muslim, is, the literal word, is one who submits to a reality, a greater reality, to submit to goodness, the values of Islam. Compassion, kindness. If you're not doing those, then you're not really behaving like a Muslim. You might have taken up the guard. And I'm sorry, this is another area that we have taken up the guard. Because we've got corporate Muslims these days. We've got reformist Muslims. We have Muslims who are apologist Muslims. We have Muslims who are, uh, you know, uh, just about bending over in every way they can to try and make things work. And I'll name organizations because uh, I'm willing to stand up and be counted because I was very much uh, involved in the interfaith industry, very much involved with British government in terms of its so-called desire to create a, um, uh, a, an integration of Muslims in society post-77. And I was deeply disappointed what, with what was really going on. What was really going on was, hang on, we haven't got enough spies in this community. We don't have enough people observing. We don't have enough contacts. Actually, this community is completely on its own. Uh, it's, it's doing what it wants. We don't have enough people to be able to suss out what's going on here. And we need to now have people who go and do this. And I'm sorry, everybody from these uh, organizations like Muslim Voices, but every organization now funded by British government is an, actually uh, uh, an agency for information gathering, primarily, and for social engineering. If you, I, I dare any of you to go and look at the websites of, say, uh, organisations like, hmm, let me think, uh, let's pick Muslim Women's Network. That's a lovely one, isn't it? And you will see flashed across their website regular notices about FGM, female genital mutilation, for those who don't know what that is, okay? You will see notice of forced marriages, massive campaigns. You will see the campaign on, uh, I don't know, uh, let's think about, oh, violent extremism, yes. Let's throw in another one, uh, mi uh, misogyny, perhaps. Let's chuck in another thing, uh, perhaps, uh, around, uh, well, the list was there, I was going over my mind, but there's at least seven or eight standard things, whether it's halal slaughter, the latest thing as well. You'll see them regurgitated on all of these websites. You'll see them promoted within the community, you'll see agendas there which are since clearly generated by a, a thought-out constructed strategy. And that thought-out constructed strategy comes from uh, think tanks, for instance, like, uh, let's say, policy exchange. You know, policy exchange is just one of those. Uh, the the, the, the uh, social cohesion uh, uh, group as well, themselves, all linked up uh, to actually roll out this agenda, which is there to say, look, Muslims are big trouble, we need to sort them out, we need to have a policy. Uh, Michael Gove was part of, he was actually on, he was the actual director, the guy who set up, one of the guys who set up policy exchange. He today runs the entire education policy, which is witch hunting Muslim schools, uh, many would argue. So to be honest with you, to be naive as to say there isn't an agenda uh, out there in terms of how we make Muslims assimilate or integrate into British society in a way that we, that, that's required by establishment is naivety in the extreme. The reality is that it, it does exist. The communities themselves are not equipped to deal with that scale of intrusion and social engineering. And they, the communities themselves don't have the infrastructures in place to deal with their basic problems. Because, hang on, let, and now I will take a pause and actually look at my statistics. Because whilst, whilst the government's really keen on all this FGM and, and all this, these sort of issues, what actually is going on is that the, uh, that the, Muslims, uh, the Muslims' crime rate, that the, uh, the, the, the Muslims in prisons are the fastest growing uh, 
the population, around 15% it's estimated now. Uh, poverty in terms of Muslims, Muslims are likely, uh, are, are, are they're, they're three times more stuck in, uh, under the poverty, I'm sorry Hannah, can I just grab this, I, I need the actual statistics so I'm not waffling off the top of my head on this. Here is, okay, crime, 17% of prisoners in the UK are now Muslims. Muslim population rise, more recent data taken from the Labour Force survey found that Muslim population uh, is, is growing faster than all the others. That confirms my suspicion of why they be, would be worried. Uh, Muslim unemployment uh, is, uh, according to 2004 annual population survey, uh, British Muslims stood at 15.8% compared to a national average of 4.7%. So the government's not concerned about this unemployment within Muslim communities. Muslim women are, you know, 70 to 80 percent unemployed. Muslims below UK poverty line is 35 percent overall of households uh, compared to, I think, the national average, which is uh, a third of that. The list goes on. So the priorities for the community, the social priorities for community, are to do with unemployment, are to do with uh, 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 political empowerment to do with in engagement, to do with uh, poverty eradication. I'd argue that, and that's what many thinking community leaders would add. The British government seems to think actually our only problem is violent extremism and, and misogyny. So we've got two different trains of thought about what integration means to the Muslim community. Muslims themselves have got their own issues in terms of infrastructural uh, inadequacies, which I could go into, there's a whole list I'm not going to go into, and the British government is not uh, recognising any of those. I'm not blaming all of the things on the British government that they've got to deal with it, but once you start heaping this other agenda and rolling this out, you're only going to get one, one result. It's going to be a complete disparity between the Muslim community, mainstream society, and uh, the establishment. The, the final nail in the coffin is is our dear media, which is rolling out a non-stop narrative. It's probably about the second or third time that halal slaughter has come back on the scene. And we've got this cyclical thing. In spring, it's halal slaughter. In winter, the niqab comes in. It's all very, very beautifully timed. You know, We seem to have to read you. And then we're caught making happy videos to justify just happy how happy we are. You know, The reality is that Muslims themselves are in a state of crisis. The youth themselves have an identity crisis of major proportions. The government is completely insensitive to that and has no program for addressing those kind of issues. And we have a huge impasse uh, in terms of you know, whether Muslims truly will be happy in this society. Now, on that note, I think I probably overstretched my time. And I apologize for that, uh, Shabir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohsin. Um, I certainly resonate with a lot of what you said and also the experiences of living in this country for nearly 60 odd years and growing up um, and going to school. So, obviously, you know, my younger sister here is of a different generation than I am. However, um, almost 60 years. Almost 60 years. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm older than you also, yes? Yeah? <laughs> Younger than <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, but at least I've got my hair. So I think uh, the, the points that um, all three speakers have raised are poignant and really um, we've got about half an hour for QA. Um, so I don't want to take too much time from the QA. However, what I do want to say is that. Not only is the community in crisis, as uh, uh, Brother Mosin has suggested, um, but I think there are huge issues of identity in the sense that, as Muslims, what does it mean to be a Muslim? Firstly, and there are differences between first, second, and third generation immigrants. And not only that, we live in London and the Southeast. And if you go to other cities of the UK, Bradford, Manchester, London, um, Bradford, Manchester, Leeds, and so on, it'd be a different kind of mindset there also. That in itself is quite interesting how the community, but obviously the uh, sort of underlying core value is 
of um, you know peace, humanity, consideration, all of these things. Then the question arises: Does one need to be a Muslim to have these things? Because these are core human values. So are we going to um, you know what um, our Archbishop of Canterbury said? Post-religious times we are living. So the whole battle is not just of Muslims and non-Muslims, but I believe it's of secularism and religiosity. And that's where the battle lines are. And I think there are lots of bridges that can be built between believers, irrespective of being Muslims or um, Christians or Jews, even, um, you know, sort of those by, you know, what Muslims would define as Kafirs, Hindus. I mean, I, I remember my father, who was an active a uh, member of the interfaith community and he used to always say that as an immigrant community we have the same problem of poverty, unemployment, jobs, housing. These are the issues that affect a community living in this country. And those are the sort of, especially with the economic sort of uh, crisis that we've been facing in the UK, I think there's a great opportunity for the Muslim community to work with the wider community to build bridges so that we can be an effective um, challenge to the false narrative that is being presented by the ruling elite. Not only do they want to target Muslims, but I think they want to, if you're a male reader, they want to target everyone else other than themselves. So I leave the floor for uh, Q&A. Um, I'm sure there are many questions. I've got the